in the last video, we talked about why we would do an internal standard in the first place, right? We said internal standards are incorporated into a method to check equipment functionality, to check the equipment auto sampler, to make sure it's performing the proper way. Not really your technique, not how you made your standards, but the equipment and how it's running throughout the entire method. It's just one of the ways that we can do it out of many ways that we can do it. So we said internal standards are uh, injected into our actual standards that we make as well as the samples that we analyze as well. So I want to talk just for um, maybe a minute or two on what makes a good candidate for an internal standard. And I always abbreviate internal standard with an IS. I get lazy and that's my abbreviation for it. So what makes a good internal standard? Well, this really depends. And it depends on the method and it depends on what you're analyzing for. What are you trying to measure? That's really the thing of what's going to determine internal standard. So let's say that I have my analyte. And let's say that the analyte is a molecule, and I'm just going to draw a blob to represent that. You'll know what that structure is. You'll know the properties of that structure. You'll know formula weights. You'll know uh, makeups, chemical compositions, percent compositions of that particular analyte. Well, when you pick out an internal standard, what you want to do is that you want to mimic that as much as possible. So these two should be equivalent in shape, equivalent in structure, equivalent in percent composition. But we know that it cannot be an exact match. Nothing is. If it was an exact match, it would be the same compound, right? So it's going to have to differ maybe in more than one way, and that's okay. The key here is close. They want to be close together. They want to be chemical cousins. So for instance, if this has seven carbons in total, this one would probably want to have seven to nine carbons or six to nine carbons somewhere within that window. You would want it kind of close. If this formula weight was around 100, you would want another formula weight that would be very close to that, maybe 90 to 110, something very similar. If this had a functional group of an alcohol on it, you would want to make sure that an alcohol functional group would also show up on your internal standard. Try to get them as close as possible and that is a very good candidate for an internal standard. If this one does not mix with water, then you want to make sure that this one does not mix with water. Same chemical properties, same physical properties, or at least as close as you can get them. So this is going to be number one. And I'm going to group all of those together into the number one category. That is what makes a very good internal standard. You want similar physical and chemical properties. And then you're good. But you're not out of the water yet. Because number two, you want to choose something that is not going to be found in a sample. And that's pretty important. Let's think about that. Let's say that I bring in a sample and this sample is very complex. There's a lot of things on the inside of it, right? And let's say that I add the internal standard into the sample. That internal standard cannot already be present in the sample. Because when I go and analyze this, my internal standard signal is going to be much higher. And the reason is because some of it was already present. 
and that's going to mess up my calculations. It messes up everything that I want to do here, right? If it's already there, if it's already present, and I add even more to it, then the signal is going to be lying to me in a way. I'm going to think that there's only one milliliter of internal standard that I've added into that sample. When actuality, there's more because it was already present before I added another one milliliter inside. So I have to make sure that the sample does not have this particular type of compound on the inside. Because of that, these internal standards are very uncommon structures. They are very uncommon compounds. And that is why. You have to, folks. You have to choose something that's not very commonly found in anything. And because of that, internal standards can cost a lot of money. Sometimes the internal standard is what drives the cost of the method that you're trying to analyze. Well, to follow up on that with number two, finding things that are uncommon, it is very common to use radio labeled internal standards. That means typically carbon has a certain weight on the periodic table and an internal standard maybe could use a carbon 13 instead. An isotope of it, right? Or let's say hydrogen is typically one, we can use a deuterated compound. Instead of hydrogen it has deuterium on it that is somewhat of a radio labeled molecule. And this is because we know that these things are not going to be found. We know that those aren't going to be present. And if my equipment can determine the difference between C12 and C13 or H1 and H2, then I'm good to go. I can use those types of compounds for my internal standards. Sometimes those equipment cannot be used for that purpose. Equipment's not that sensitive. It cannot tell me the differences between carbon-12 and carbon-13 or hydrogen-1 and hydrogen-2. And when it comes to that scenario, you have to make sure that you just choose a compound that is not very common. It's a compound that's going to be weird and wonky and strange looking and because of that it's going to be very expensive for you. But either way you go, you're going to invest money into the internal standards. And this is why we have to make sure that they are not present in any sample, period, at all, that comes into the laboratory for the analysis of the internal standard. Okay? So there's a couple of guidelines to go through and, and maybe think about when you choose an internal standard or when you read a method that says we're using an internal standard and this is what we're going to be using, you now know some of the maybe background that's went on behind closed doors before you've read those directions on why we're using that particular compound as an internal standard each and every time. So in the next video, we're going to do finally an example. I'm going to work out an example of how an internal standard is going to be processed and how to do calculations with them as well. Uh, so get your calculators ready. Get Excel ready. We're going to be using both of them. Uh, but I think that you'll find out that the math here is not that difficult. I think it's actually one of the simplest things that we do.